So what is feature writing? Well, feature writing is the most rewarding, but it's also the most challenging type of journalistic or public relations writing. Think of it as a new story written like a short story. You have the creative freedom of short story writing, meaning you can tell the story in any way you want, but it has to be accurate. So it's got to be factual, but you should also take the reader on an emotional, compelling journey. So the feature story's form is different than that of a traditional news story in that it needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. So unlike the stories you would see in uh, a newspaper like the National Post or the Toronto Star in terms of a news story, uh, the reader can't really get what they need from a feature story just by quickly skimming a few paragraphs. They really have to read the whole story in order to understand it. So in an uh, inverted pyramid story, uh, the structure looks something like this on the left. You've got your lead at the top, and then you put your details always in the order of importance. So for example, if there has been a plane crash, you would put the number of dead uh, in the lead, and then you would uh, continue down uh, till you get to uh, what you consider the least important information. By contrast, in a feature story, you reveal details in a way calculated to elicit a response from your reader. You want them to feel curiosity, surprise, empathy, even inspiration. Uh, like we mentioned before, the story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the best stories both inform and entertain. So what can they be about? Uh, a feature story can be about anything, literally anything, people, places, or things. You're limited only by your imagination. But whatever the subject is, good feature stories have a few things in common. And one of the most important, and probably the most important if you want your reader to continue reading, is you have to hook the reader with a compelling, intriguing lead. So let's take a look now at some leads that really work well. Here's one. They met through video dating when the sight of his muscular build drove her so wild she smacked kisses all over the monitor. Never mind his rowdy past, his other mates, his penchant for projectile vomiting when annoyed. True love forgives. Now the young couple would like to start a family, part animal urge, part science project. For she is Coco, the world famous gorilla. A two-time National Geographic cover model, she wowed the public in the 1970s by learning to communicate with humans using American Sign Language. That lead was written by Jane Meredith Adams of the Chicago Tribune, and it works by holding in abeyance some key facts. We don't find out until the last uh, few sentences that we're actually talking about animals here. Coco, the gorilla, and a potential mate. And they met via a video monitor at first. So initially, we really don't get any of the key facts. In fact, we actually are thinking that these are human beings when in fact they're not. But we're still intrigued by details like... Uh, his rowdy past, his other mates, his penchant for projectile vomiting. How could true love overcome something like that? And we find out later we're talking about uh, two gorillas. So here's another lead by Andrea Elliott, Andrea Elliott in the New York Times. The young Egyptian professional could pass for any New York bachelor. Dressed in a crisp polo shirt and swathed in cologne, he races his Nissan Maxima through the rain-slick streets of Manhattan late for a date with a tall brunette. At red lights, he fusses with his hair. What sets the bachelor apart from other young men on the make is the chaperone sitting next to him, a tall, bearded man in a white robe and stiff, embroidered hat. Again, here, key details intrigue the reader and make them want to read more. Uh, the last sentence here, what sets the bachelor apart from other young men on the make is the chaperone sitting next to him. Our curiosity is aroused. Who is this man? Why is he there? He's dressed in a white robe. What is the significance of that? There are other details that really help paint a vivid picture in the mind of the reader. Uh, crisp polo shirt, swathed in, swathed in cologne, rain slick streets. We picture him fussing with his hair. By the way, this article is part of a series of articles that won this author a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, here is a lead that's close to my heart, and that's because it got me a job. Uh, let's take a look at the lead first, and then I'll explain. 
When Paul Henderson scored the winning goal in the final seconds of the 1972 Summit Series against the Soviet Union, he seemed to have it all. A loving family, lots of money, and the adulation of millions of Canadians. But he was still unhappy. I was missing out on the spiritual side of life, said Henderson. So that's a lead I wrote more than 20 years ago now, hard to believe, for the Oakville Beaver. And I submitted it as part of, I submitted it as part of a portfolio uh, to a newspaper in northern Manitoba. And the editor there liked this story and a couple of others so much, he hired me uh, right after he read them, called me up, and uh, I was off to my first job. So I'm happy with this lead. I'm sure it's not as good as the previous ones, uh, but it did help me in my career. So feature stories, as you can see, are about deta details. They focus on details that are unusual and that have human interest, and you want to create a vivid picture in the mind of your reader. Now, how do you get these details? Well, you have to do your research. You meet the people in your story, you interview them at length in person and not over email or on the phone. That's key because you notice things in person like how the person looks, uh, their, uh, uh, their living conditions, their decorations, how they walk, how they talk. Those things are not going to be clear over email or the phone. And you observe them and you write down your notes. Once you've got those details, you organize uh, them into a structure that makes sense and you focus on one or maybe two key themes. What is this story about? Picture yourself taking your reader by the hand and leading him or who leading him or her through the story. You never want to confuse or puzzle your reader, right? So you always want to use transitions to guide them from one segment of the story to the next. For example, here, and there are many different techniques to do this, many different transitions. We're just going to go through a few now. Here, uh, we're using something called echoing or using words or concepts from the preceding paragraph. The accident left 41-year-old Jane Smith battling Whoops. The accident left 41-year-old Jane Smith battling for her life in the Toronto Medical Center's intensive care unit. And the second sentence, the echo, you say Smith, a mother of three, suffered head injuries, a crushed leg, and a broken back. And the word Smith there helps lead the reader from one sentence to the next and one concept to the next. You can use contrast or comparison to accomplish the same thing. For example, Officials insist the campus has plenty of parking spaces. However, cars could be seen Monday parked in grassy medians in front of fire hydrants, on sidewalks, and even in one case, right in the middle of the street. So in that case, the word however brings you from one concept to another. You can use time. In a time sequence, you can do something uh, like the following. The speeding car barreled through a red light at the old Fort Parkway intersection Hitting speeds of up to 120 kilometers per hour, the car then careened up Broad Street, finally smashing, smashing into a utility pole near Thompson Lane. And the key word here is then. That is taking the reader by the hand and then saying, and then this happened, helping the reader understand what you're trying to say and what the story is about. So you always want to place yourself inside the mind of your reader. Now, you may think you don't know how to do that, but you already do. It's a skill you learned as a young child, and you learned it when you figured out how to lie. Let me explain. Before I do that, let's take a look at a liar. A cute liar, but a liar nonetheless. Hey, Brindley, did you get into the Nutella? No. You didn't? Really? No. Promise? No. Brindley, did you get into the Nutella? No. <laughs> really? No! Well, what did you do? I just trusted the dishes. <laughs> so what this adorable little girl just did uh, was lie in a pretty funny way to her mother with Nutella all over her face. But she demonstrated something that uh, only human beings can do and some primates, and that's called theory of mind. In order to lie like she attempted to, you need to put yourself in the mind of another person and be aware that they may have a different perception of reality than your own. And what good writers do is they put themselves in the minds of their readers and they're able to feel what their reader feels and see what their reader sees. And that's what I want you to try and do when you're writing your feature story.
let's take a look at the profile, which is one of the most common type of feature story. A profile is a short, vivid character sketch about one person. It's not just a list of boring biographical, biographical facts or unrelated anecdotes. It includes descriptions, quotations, and explanations that are combined in a way to make your subject come alive. You should always use quotes in your feature profiles, and they should be used in a way that enhances color and character. Don't just put a quote in for the sake of putting a quote. It should always serve a purpose. You should emphasize what's unique about the person, and you should paint memorable scenes. Don't just say that someone is funny or smart or brave. Give specific examples that provide insight for your audience. Here's a passage from the previous uh, piece by Andrea Elliott that I quoted. And this is a, a short scene where the Imam lands at Kennedy International Airport. Mr. Shata landed at Ken Kennedy International Airport wearing a crimson felt hat and a long gray jilhab, I, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there, that fell from his neck to his sandal toes, the proud dress of an Al-Azhar scholar. He spoke no English, but already he had some of the West inside. He could quote liberally from Voltaire, Shaw, and Kant. For an Egyptian, he often jokes, he was inexplicably punctual. The first thing Mr. Shada loved about America, like Germany, was the order. In Egypt, if a person passes through a red light, that means he's smart, he said. In America, he's very disrespected. So what the writer has done here in a very efficient way, not too many words here, but she's painted a very vivid picture of Mr. Shata, and she's noticed some key details. She's mentioned the fact that although he couldn't speak English, he did know Voltaire, Shaw, and Kant, and he could quote from them. He was punctual, even though that wasn't a common characteristic uh, among Egyptians. And he also loved America because in Egypt, if you pass through a red light, you're smart, but here in America, you're very disrespected. So you get the feeling that he likes rules and appreciates people keeping to the rules. So a very vivid description, noticing key details, and using a quotation that really illuminates character. So once you have painted a picture of your subject and brought them alive so that the reader feels like they really know them, uh, it's time to end your story. And an ending should not be an afterthought in feature writing. In many ways, it's as important and even more important than the beginning because it really needs to resonate with your reader. There is a great writer by the name of Bruce De Silva, and he had three rules for a great ending. Number one, you have to tell the reader that the story is over. You have to nail the central point of the story to the reader's mind, and that point has to resonate. And here's what he said about it. You should hear it echoing in your head when you put the paper down, when you turn the page. It shouldn't just end and have a central point. It should stay with you and make you think a little bit. The very best endings do something in addition to that. They surprise you a little. There's a kind of twist to them that's unexpected. And yet, when you think about it for a second, you realize it's exactly right. So here are a couple of examples from great endings from the stories that I showed you earlier. Uh, first one from in a, An Imam in America. Time and again, Mr. Shatta's new country has called for creativity and patience, for a careful negotiation between tradition and modernity. Here you don't know what will solve a problem, he said. It's about looking for a key. So a profound quote that uh, wraps up the story and gives you a real insight as to what uh, his approach is in solving problems while he is here in America and how that has had to change. Then the last quote from the story called Sean's Echo, and I should tell you that this story is about a mother who donated a device uh, from her dead son to a little boy so that he also could uh, have his stuttering cured. The hardest day came a couple of weeks ago. Martha didn't want to leave the house. Andy asked if they should visit Sean's grave, plant some flowers. But Martha didn't want to do that either. She went into Sean's room, lay on his bed, listened to the music he liked. She felt incomplete. And Sean, of course, is her uh, son who passed away. She didn't hear the phone ring. But later that day, there was a message for her on the answering machine. It was from a boy like hers, wishing her a happy Mother's Day. And that message, of course, was from the boy uh, who she gave Sean's 
Echo Device 2. A very touching ending and a very appropriate ending to that story. So, rewrites and revisions. They are probably the key to producing great work and they shouldn't be something to be avoided. A lot of people think of rewrites and revisions as um, arduous or tedious. They shouldn't be. It should really be something you look forward to because that is what's going to take your work to the next level. Even the greatest writers have to revise their work, often several times to achieve quality. Spelling and grammatical errors ruin the quality of your story, and you should always double and triple check your facts because nothing ruins a story more than getting a key fact wrong. Spelling your subject's name incorrectly is a cardinal sin. And just to give you an example, some proof that great writers do revise and rewrite, this is George Orwell's actual page of rewrites and revisions for the first page of perhaps his greatest novel, 1984. And you can see it's, uh, you, can't almost, you can't even read some of it because he's made so many notations and corrections. So if it's good enough for George Orwell, it should be good enough for you. If you have any questions, you can reach me at Kurt, K-U-R-T, period, Mueller, M-U-L-L-E-R, at mohawkcollege.ca. Thank you very much.